on that, if you were not here, um, we heard it a little bit earlier, um, Ilya, co-founder of Near. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about incentivizing open source AI uh, and kind of why is this important, what are the different dimensions, and uh, uh, what are the different use cases of open source. So for those who are not familiar with who I am, yeah. Sorry. So that's not familiar. I started in machine learning back in 2008, and uh, I was working at Google Research across a number of natural language understanding tasks, uh, and, and I ended up being a pretty big contributor to TensorFlow when it was just starting, uh, pretty much a, because I believe in open source, and I saw that as really kind of amazing opportunity for everyone to uh, plug in into deep learning. Uh, ecosystem, and uh, as I was kind of starting to uh, prepare to leave to start a startup, uh, there was this uh, crazy idea I came up, which is, you know, what if we don't use sequence uh, in the sequence models, uh, which ended up being the transformer technology that now powers all of the uh, kind of, uh, at least majority of the advancements in, uh, in the AI space. Now, Near started as an AI startup. We were trying to teach machines to code, which in 17 sounded like a science fiction. And now it seems like, yeah, it seems reasonable, you know, it's happening. Um, we did not have Microsoft funding or, you know, a huge lump of money committed by a billionaire. And so we were trying to uh, do a lot more crowdsourcing. We had students around the world in China and Eastern Europe pretty much writing code for us, writing descriptions for code. And so we were trying to get like a lot better training data. But uh, all of those countries in the US have some kind of challenge with sending money. And so that's how we started the crypto. Exploring crypto is just like, hey, we need to send money like efficiently, automatically, program programmably. And it's not a lot of money, right? They were sending like 15 cents, you know, 30 cents here and there. And so, you know, this global payment network that everybody's talking about seems like a solution. But even back then in 2018, um, after the crash, after everything, it was still too expensive. Like it was, the fees were higher than what we were sending people. And so we started kind of doing research, figuring out what's going on, and saw the opportunity to build something that's truly scalable, easy to use, easy to build on. For those who are not familiar with language models, this is not a new thing. Like language model is just a statistical tool. It's been around since like 50s. And the interesting kind of transformation happened from my perspective in 13 when the word embeddings were introduced. So word embeddings is this idea that instead of having a symbolic uh, kind of way of uh, looking at language, right, you know, you look at a word and it's a word and you cannot do anything with it, is actually turning this word into a vector, into a set of numbers that now you can do math with, right? You can, you know, uh, calculate the distance between them. You can, you know, multiply them by matrix and kind of change where they are in the multidimensional space. Uh, at the same time, there's been a lot of research on like how do we do recurrent neural networks? How do we have something that can understand sequences and you know process them? And then again, this is a pretty long, like uh, old thing from '97, but uh, between like complexity of training them and also just not having a lot of the uh, kind of basic tooling and not having uh, good compute. Until 14, they were not really used that widely. Now, what the challenge was with recurrent models, recurrent neural networks, has been that they are actually mimicking human, right? We read one word at a time. And from computers, we don't want that. We want computer to read everything at once and give us answer. We're not gonna wait for them to, you know, study 10 years to like get to a level and actually you know, reread the book and go to the library. And especially when you work at Google and you are trying to launch something on google.com, you have a very strict latency requirements. Like it needs to answer within like 200 milliseconds or user's gonna leave. And this recurrent neural networks, if you try to give them you know, first 10 uh, pages of Google search, you know, they'll take like 10, 20 seconds to just read all that. Now, in parallel, there was this idea, what if we don't use uh, kind of um, sequence of words, we just jumble all the words and run it. And so we actually shipped a model that was answering questions on google.com that had not used anything about sequence of the words at all. Literally, all the words, embed them, 
jumble them, and then score what's the answer. And it was actually worked okay, surprisingly. Uh, and so kind of when the idea came uh, to Jakob specifically, hey, what if we do use attention on top of the words, but we don't use, like we don't actually read one word at a time, we can use it kind of in parallel. Uh, and so you have a very simple idea. You have an input embedding. You like multiply them by, by a matrix. Uh, you use attention or, and then like pretty much use that to encode the whole document at once, right? It takes you th the same amount of time it would take to read one word before uh, because you can do it highly parallel on GPU. Um, it actually worked. <laughs> Surprisingly, right? So we, we ran the you know simple prototype. It worked, and then you know a lot of work later, uh, got state of the art, and then uh, many years later, a lot of teams you know worked on scaling this and training it with more data, figured out h exactly how much data to train on, and so we have transformers. And the benefit of these models is really that they have kind of an amazing ability to scale, uh, kind of with compute, uh, to really be able to do things in parallel, right? So. Instead of kind of reading things at a time, you can feed them, you know, millions of documents. Uh, you can have, you know, lots of GPUs pipelined, and you're able to kind of train all that uh, at large scale. And so we have this kind of accelerated innovation, right? Uh, I mentioned that at, at uh, kind of fireside chat, the you know a AI was like a tool that everybody used, uh, and like it's been used for you know for decades for various things. But now we went from just a tool to now something that actually can communicate with people directly, right? Uh, we're able to have, you know, commu like kind of impact of these models where there's no potentially human who is actually deciding how to interpret results. It actually goes directly to, the, um, to other people. And this comes with risks and obviously positive sides. Uh, but I think the important part that I want to talk about here is kind of limitations of the model where you have a specific company that runs this, that trains this model, that runs them and provides an a interface to use it, right? Because what it means is you have lots of different teams, right, that are not engineering teams, which are kind of impacting what you see and how it works, right? You have a team that goes and decides what training data goes in the model. This is somebody's decision that, hey, I'm not going to include this document into the model. I'm not going to include uh, this article, and I'm not going to take this information. There's a legal team that says, hey, this is copyrighted, and we cannot use it. This has you know, potential liability. Uh, we're getting sued because of this. There's an ethics team that says, you know, we don't think this is ethical, and makes some decision on that. And all of that also applies when you're actually using the model, right? And uh, you're asking it a question. And again, there's a legal team that says, like, we cannot say these things at all. And there's an ethics team that says, this is not moral, this is not ethical. Uh, and these teams are making decisions for you, and they are, you know, sitting in some geography, and they're making decisions for everyone globally, right? They're not, like, you know, I mean, obviously, we're here in San Francisco and in Bay Area, but you know, world is way more global. The set of you know, kind of things that are, uh, for example, legal here are legal in other places and the other way around. So, like, all of these decisions are made kind of out of out of one place. And on top of it, I mentioned like the thing that I'm mostly concerned with is that economically, it also makes sense to start, uh, you know, monetizing the output. Right now, you know, you're assuming it's coming from a model, but it can be coming from an ad. It can be coming from, like, literally an auction underneath that says, you know, who is the highest bidder to output you the answer. And uh, ad auctions are actually way more efficient than the LLMs, and so you, you and paralyzable, highly paralyzable, and so you can make a lot of money doing that. Hopefully I'm not giving ideas to people. <laughs> and so, what we're getting into is a world where there's a ton of people and a ton of business that kind of is between you and the underlying data set that actually is, you know, supposedly the truth that, you know, you have a model to interpret for you. 
And I mean, we see this happening right now and unrolling kind of across. This is like just some art, like some articles from you know last week about you know OpenAI getting sued, Google getting sued. You know, people are uh, scared of this. We obviously just had Biden saying he wants to ban all the uh, kind of generative voices. Uh, so like we have like this massive unroll of like regulatory questions and kind of in lawsuits trying to decide what's right and what's wrong. And we do have risks, right? Um, specifically, I mean, the regulatory pressure threatens that you now will not be able to train a model uh, because you're a startup, because you'll need to have a huge team of you know, ethics specialists and model testers who will be ensuring that this model will be cor like, you know, not doing wrong things without actually any formal definition of what that is. We have challenges with open source licenses that are either too permissive, right, or, um, and like you're not, like as a builder of open source, you're not getting anything back, or too strict and then nobody wants to use it. We have kind of the challenge of that these models are indeed very good at manipulating people, and if somebody weaponizes it, uh, we don't have right now a very good way to protect against that. And this will lead to even more you know, regulatory kind of uh, scrutiny because they want to prevent that. We have economics of big companies which are kind of skewing incentives, right, and like generating more and more revenue out of this because uh, that's what they do. And you know, these this tools are really good at giving the massive leverage of whoever using them effectively has distribution. So we have this kind of fork in the road, which is we have kind of centralized companies which will you know, have this massive departments that will decide what's, run, what's right and what's wrong. They will be though focused on generating more revenue per user because they already have billions of users, like you cannot grow your market more, um, which means they will be like manipulating and kind of like not intentionally, but like through the models that they're training, kind of changing people's behavior to you know, generate more revenue, click on more ads, you know, go and buy more products in real world. Or we need an alternative world where we can have models that are on your side. Models and kind of software and systems that are maximizing your you know, happiness, your state of affairs, you're focused on you, not on maximizing revenue for somebody else. And that's a, I would say, like fundamental choice. And this is where kind of Web3 comes in as a fundamental tool to enable this uh, because the general incentives of like regular corporations are not designed for that. You always will be, you know, as soon as you're not a startup, you, you are a big corporation is trying to squeeze out a, like high ARPU. Uh, and so we need a new, new approach that incentivizes open source. And so this is really the case for the open source AI and for using incentives and systems to ensure that we're actually keeping uh, kind of this model's open source. There's a way to uh, kind of access them, approach them, leverage them, make sure that, you know, verify that they're on your side. So kind of crypto is that incentive layer. It's an ability to kind of borrow from the future, borrow the value, be able to fund open source right now uh, without needing to generate, like create a con like a business model, you know, tomorrow, which is what you do as a startup, but being able to create economic model, create value, and have this value owned by the community that funded it, and that's kind of the core innovation that we have in crypto, and we need to apply it here to really prevent this uh, dark road. So. Uh, kind of switching to the brighter side, there's a lot of different things that needs to be built, right? And we had a, kind of a bunch of speakers uh, actually talking about a few of these things here. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of cluster it for you into a few groups. Uh, so we have a lot of things to do on the data side. And that, from my perspective, data is where kind of the next uh, kind of the war ha gonna happen. Actually the models, you know, you know, people are training them, it's cool. But the data is actually what you know, defines how this model works. And we see now already you know, companies closing access to their data, charging more for their APIs. Um, you know, we have like fake data. We probably have some nefarious actors who are generating and pretty much injecting 
uh, biased data into the kind of into the public sources such that it gets scraped later and affects how the models are trained later. So all of this is kind of like the battlefield that's unrolling kind of on internet right now. And we need tools to ensure that it's done kind of well, it's uh, on, the, on the user's side. So we need a way to uh, have content reputation, crowdsourcing for tr more training data, data curation. We need to have a personal data that's not leaking uh, anywhere that is actually uh, encrypted on your, and uh, only accessible from your side. We have infrastructure, right? We have uh, heard from provable training from Jensen, provable inference uh, from uh, Modulus and Ritual. Uh, we need you know, open source foundational models that are not just from large companies. And ideally, we, sh we know which training data went into it. Uh, we need on-edge compute and ability to run these models on your device, uh, have kind of local data retrieval from your personal data. And we need a ton of apps which actually you know, justify building all this infrastructure so that we can actually have that utility uh, directly uh, directed to the user. So one thing I want to mention specifically is content reputation because there is this kind of um, like question that a lot of people ask, which is, hey, well, if everything's open source, wouldn't that let you know, malicious actors, nefarious actors to take these models and use them for evil purposes, right? And my answer to that is nefarious actors always get their uh, hands on whatever the latest technology is. This has happened with you know, nuclear weapons, this has happened with whatever weapons, and th those were military protected, right, with barbed wire and machine guns. Right now, AI models are not protected like that. There is no barbed wire around OpenAI office. And so like, people will get access to, to all of these models. Like, we just had a, lo you know, a lawsuit just happened with uh, a TPU chip designs were stolen, uh, for example. So this is not like uh, the, pro like by close sourcing it, we're not solving anything. Now what we should be solving for is, if imagine everybody has access to the most advanced AI intelligence tooling, what do we do to make sure that whatever you're looking at is not poisoned? Whatever you're looking at is not, uh, even if it's generated, but at least you know who published it and what's the reputation behind it. And so the way to do that is actually to have a content reputation. And you use cryptography to kind of provide you prominence. You use kind of community to provide you context. So you can have right now if, you know, like a system that you, when you go and browse your internet or uh, access it through, um, uh, through the website, through the social networks, uh, it actually provides the context that this image was, you know, jet, like posted a week ago, and uh, it was posted by this account, and you can, you know, inspect which the account is, and you can have people from the community comment if this is actually image taken out of context, or it's or it's misleading, or it's generated, and you know, it's not actually real, right? And so, I mean, X actually kind of moving in that direction, but like on specifically X platform, you can imagine that across all pieces of content across the whole internet. This is one, one side of actually regulation where I think regular, regulators should mandate something like this. And similarly, how we had transitioned from HTTP to HTTPS to ensure security of the internet. So the other side is I want to talk about, um, and uh, Avicho uh, at the panel kind of mentioned, like there's different dimensionalities of decentralized versus uh, kind of the tool versus the autonomous versus centralized. So not everything that's uh, kind of, for example, things like a tools, right? If, if even your GPT-5 doctor doesn't always need to have provability if you're running it on your side, right? So this is kind of the idea of tool. It could still be decentralized, but runs on my phone, right? Versus, you know, ChatGPT runs on the server of uh, OpenAI. Now, if you do want AI governance or in-chain finance or decision-making, you do need to prove to everybody else that it's indeed correct answer. And that's where you need probability. Kind of the more autonomous you want this uh, decision-making to be happening. And so there's kind of like a, a whole spectrum of different types of agents uh, that I uh, want to introduce, which are how they specialized, what kind of output they provide, right? It doesn't always need to be text. They can do and actually directly do action. 
or they can provide you a rich UI component, rich UI interface. Um, how autonomous they are, right? Is it a tool that you tell something and gives you input and you interpret it, or it's something that goes and execute on your, uh, on your request, or it's actually continuously uh, operating and even has a reinforcement learning engine that you just give a goal, right? Maximize number of trees in Stanford, and it just goes and execute a plan completely independently. And you also have this infrastructure used, right? Is it like running on centralized, on your local model, or it's a decentralized inference, right, with some probability. So those are the like, very different spectrum of uh, how the model works. Um, and so we kind of started just AI registry uh, to have a way to kind of have these different agents in one place and start providing this, have it decentralized. It's fully, uh, the registry is on chain, the kind of agents themselves are on chain, the front end for them is on chain, and so you can also like specialize output and, and everything fully on chain. So this is just like an example of uh, kind of managing agents uh, from one place. The other side is intelligent assets. So this is uh, this idea that not just smart contracts, you can have a you know decision making on the asset itself to be done by a machine learning model. Now the Kind of caveat right now is that this is models are not very trained to in adversarial behavior, and so it's possible to like convince a model to give you all the money or something, right? And um, uh, Niraj was showing actually they have a demo of that. Uh, we also have somebody on near just launch Shield GPT, which is you deposit your meme coin and then you convince it to buy more of the meme coin you deposited. <laughs> Uh, so they actually literally exploiting the idea that it's convincible, and so you like need to do it. And so people are like pretty much selling and buying stuff uh, through this. So it's an intelligent vault with language model as a decision maker and the way to convince it uh, one way or another. So you can have all this like interesting demos now, which are really leveraging assets on chain uh, and making decisions based on that, but with the caveat that they're not very robust like a smart contract. Uh, now. Over time, we'll see more robustness. We'll see kind of more adversarial behavior protection. I think there's some uh, like design, model design that needs to happen to address that. Uh, but I'm sure we'll, we'll see more uh, kind of improvement there. We also have really interesting ways where we change how we interact with computing in general. And so this can be either language interface where you say like, hey, mint me an NFT, or you can actually generate the user interface for you, right, by saying like, hey, you know, I was like, should uh, make a list of all data sets, you know, showing this data. It generates a UI itself, and then you can connect it to some specific data source. Uh, and so this way, you can imagine over time, we have experiences which you can uh, interact with, which are not apps, right? They actually generate it for you, and they, they connect to this global network, you know, peer-to-peer -peer of data sets and of like data and other actors. Uh, and so I, I actually believe a lot of applications will uh, transform into this, into more direct action uh, and interaction and generative interfaces. Finally, there's an interesting kind of thread to pull beyond that, which is uh, as you're building this, a lot of the functions of the business are becoming automated. And so you can have a fully autonomous business where you define you know, the spectrum of th things you're doing, you fund it with money, and it starts trying to do different actions to kind of grow the business. And so one of the kind of, uh, I would say, foundational pieces for that would be a gig marketplace where either person or a agent can go and say, hey, I want something to be done. And then on the other side, anybody who has an, an account on blockchain, right, be that again, person or agent, can go and uh, do the work. And you have also a verification loop as well. So it's the idea that like you kind of knew, like even out the playground, make it really easy for anybody to participate, and then over time, AI agents going to be taking more and more of this work of the plate and kind of just bidding lower. And so this can be then on top, uh, be used by agent that runs a business and pretty much offload a bunch of work that right now you would need to hire someone. Now, if you expand it even further, you can imagine an autonomous government, right, where the decisions are made themselves by uh, both querying agents of other users as well as by an, kind of an agent that is some you know summarizes compressive information and makes a decision what to fund, uh, kind of what uh, rules to enact and uh, what decisions to make. Now, 
uh, kind of the way to think about this, this is probably going to be a reinforcement learning agent, which have you know a function, some kind of function that they're trying to maximize, and it will have a world model internally that actually is trying to predict the next state, and these models are really good at that. Um, and based on that, you know, based on possible options of uh, next state, it actually decides what actions to take. So, in, you know, these models are maintaining multiple probabilities kind of internally of what's possible uh, for predicting next token or predicting next word. And so you can have similar idea, but now predicting at the level of the system that the, the, this model is governing. So these are all kind of different examples of this, but I want to return back to the original idea that I mentioned is the open source AI requires incentivization. It requires kind of more push to ensure that we have state-of-the-art models that are accessible to everyone, that are available and uh, runnable, and at the same time, you know, have a place where we can have data sets and models and kind of agents all living in one place, accessible, non-censorable. And so at NIR, what we're trying to do is to provide you the tooling and kind of instrument to enable that. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of the ask for everybody to focus on how do we build uh, open source models, how do we continue promoting open source AI, and how do we get um, to incentivize this in a way that is propelling us to the future and kind of keeps us away from that dark, cloudy uh, world of you know, few companies controlling all of the intelligence tooling. Thank you. Any, any questions? Do we have time? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, we don't have time, so <laughs> ask me on Twitter. There's Twitter. All right. Thank you, everyone.